Today, I'm going to talk about accomplice liability. Uh, up until now, we've been operating in a very strange world for as far as criminal law is concerned, uh, where everyone is an individual island and we're assessing their criminal culpability uh, based on their individual actions and only their individual actions. So if you look at the slide here, uh, we imagine, say, there's a murder of a person, Victoria, conveniently begins with V for victim, uh, and we have three suspects, Dan, Diane, and Drew, conveniently named because D for defendant. Uh, it, up till now, we would have said, well, one of them uh, might be liable, even if they were all working together, right? Even if they all coordinated their plans uh, and like one provided a gun, one lured uh, Victoria to the location where she would be killed, and the other one did the deed and uh, actually killed her with the gun. Uh, but of course that's a fiction and it's it's not what happens in the real world. In fact, uh, criminals often coordinate their activities. So this is the first moment where we're going to start considering other forms of liability. Um, and the first type of this these, this theory or mechanism for liability is accomplice liability. Uh, in our chapter after this one, we'll get to conspiracy liability, which is different and a different way to hold one person accountable for the actions of the another. So instead of just having uh, liability of Dan, Diane, and Drew individually, uh, we can connect them through accomplice liability. So Diane might be liable under certain circumstances that I'll define and talk about uh, for the actions of Dan or Drew. Right? Dan can be liable for the actions of Diane and Drew, and so on and so on. So there's many different ways that a person uh, can be liable for the murder of uh, Victoria, even among these three people. And this is important uh, because, in fact, in any uh, larger criminal enterprise, but even small ones, uh, there is going to be coordination of activity among multiple criminals. And treating them as islands, metaphorically, uh, would miss uh, their potential liability for taking part in a larger crime. Uh, and there are certain crimes that necessarily involve large groups of people, right? You don't usually run a large-scale drug dealing operation by yourself. And so bodyguards, uh, uh, people who help launder money, your banker, uh, the corner dealers, everyone is part of uh, this sort of network and we're going to look at how accomplice liability presents one theory for prosecuting people uh, for crimes that they independently were not liable for, meaning they did not have all the act requirements in mens rea, they only were aiding and abetting uh, the underlying crime in some way. So this is an essential building block of criminal law, and it's one I'm, I'm sure you've at least heard of before. Uh, I'm not going to draw a strong distinction here between the model penal code and common law approaches because they're very similar in substance. Their difference is in form. Um, so the common law approach here, and I'm, this is a simplified version of modern common law, uh, most jurisdictions follow. Some still draw smaller distinctions that we're going to ignore. But the major distinction is between principles and accessories, and so accessories here in the slide. Um, principles are the people that are independently liable for the crime, meaning they have the requisite act requirements and mens rea, and accessories are those that aid and abet the crime. And that's the linguistic uh, labeling that you'll have to do when going through a common law problem. Uh, the model penal code, in contrast, as I noticed, noted in the text, doesn't use the same language, but it has essentially the same approach. Somebody has to be liable uh, independently. Somebody has to have committed the underlying crime, uh, but we just call people accomplices who help uh, this person, and so they're not, the, the labeling's different. But you'll notice in, in Riley v. Alaska, which is an MPC jurisdiction case in the mens rea section of this chapter, that even though they're using the NPC, they still use the labels principles and accessories. They have a lot of staying power, uh, even if they're not required or uh, the linguistic uh, way that you frame uh, this, this accomplice liability issue. But I do want to take one step back for a second and distinguish um, something that's called an accessory but is not really an accessory in terms of accomplice liability. And that's what we call accessories after the fact. Accessories after the fact are typically people that harbor fugitives, aid their escape in some way. It's better to think of accessories of after the fact as uh, just a separate crime. We could call it harboring a fugitive or aiding a fugitive. The fact that it has accessories on the label is just misleading and confusing because even if somebody is 
a so-called accessory after the fact, meaning they harbor a fugitive, it doesn't mean they become liable for all the prior crimes they committed that they did not aid and abet. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, just one thing you want to have in mind. Accessories after the fact are not really accessories uh, for what we're talking about here. Uh, so we only have one case here to, to understand the act requirements because for the most part, it's really simple. Uh, but Seos is, you know, a modern case. It was after the Supreme Court had decided a mens rea accomplice liability decision, Rosemont, um, which was actually the first time the Supreme Court had ever given any guidance on uh, mens rea for accomplice liability. It's kind of remarkable. It took till 2014. And so the court here is, you know, dealing with a pretty simple problem, but one that, you know, you might not appreciate how simple it is if you don't know the history and context of accomplice liability. Because we have two brothers here, right? Constantino and Nicholas. And uh, they are both charged uh, with um, these drug dealing crimes. And you'll notice is the first uh, discussion question mentions, uh, it doesn't require a separate charge. They're both required with the same substantive offense and either person could be the principal or accessory in the common law, or they could just be accomplices of the MPC, and um, and that's okay. But here we actually do know which brother was uh, doing everything, and that's one of the complexities here, right? Because there is a, a lot of observations, surveillance, we have witnesses, this guy Denny who's testifying about what happened, uh, and everything points to Constantino. Constantino is clearly liable, right? There's just, you know, there's no doubt here. But what about Nicholas, right? Nicholas's role here seems limited, right? Um, you know, his brother's not always with him, but he was with him on this February 4th, 2011 uh, occasion. Uh, the poll camera recording showed the brothers leave the truck and Nicholas walk over to the toolbox attached to the bed of the truck and place his hand on the toolbox lid. The video record showed the toolbox lid open and then shut with Nicholas standing beside it. But, as Nicholas points out, the feed does not show him taking anything out of the box. So he might have opened a toolbox and closed it. Doesn't seem like that big a deal. Um, but uh, the brother, when they the brothers when they enter Denny's home, Denny later testified that once inside, either Nicholas or Constantino, he's not sure who, placed four ounces of meth in his microwave and received $8,000 from him. Then we see Nicholas and Constantino return to the truck, and that's pretty much it. And so is Nicholas responsible for Constantino or Tino, as he's known? Is he responsible for the same drug crimes? And the answer is absolutely clearly yes. Um, and I, I'm making this uh, you know, very strongly so from an act requirement standpoint. Aiding and abetting, or alternate language that's sometimes used in the statute, does not require much. In fact, it requires almost anything. Any little hint uh, that a person is uh, helping uh, another. And so the act requirement here is not much of a bar for prosecution. Of course, you might be thinking in your head, well, but what if they didn't know? Well, that's a mens rea issue, right? From an act requirement, I mean, merely going along for the ride here is going to be sufficient, right? He might have been there for muscle. He might have had nothing. There may be nothing in the toolbox, and it simply uh, doesn't matter. As the court says in Sayas, Precedent sets a low bar for satisfying the affirmative act requirement, which is met when the defendant actively and knowingly, let's leave out knowingly because that's the mens rea issue, actively participates in carrying out any part of the felonious conduct, irrespective of how minimal. And that's a rule. And that's true both in the common law and MPC. So it's very easy to find an act requirement as long as a person does anything at all, anything at all um, to help in any way uh, the underlying crime. Doesn't mean they're guilty. The mens rea will help sort some of this out. Uh, but accomplice liability from an act requirement standpoint doesn't require much. And so that's it for today. Next time I will go into mens rea for accomplice liability.